Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you here at the Savoy Hotel in London, and for those of you joining online, and I think we have over 140 people around the world tuning in today, so we've got a, a sizable uh, virtual audience as well joining here. So, uh, first of all, welcome to this uh, seminar, which is being jointly hosted by BIMCO and the London Shipping Law Centre. Now, today on stage, I have four members of the drafting team who put together ShipSail. I'm just gonna introduce them. We have Matt Hannaford from Hannaford Turner Law Firm in London. We have John Varley from Arrow Shipbroking, Gustav Brun from the Hamburg Shipbro uh, Shipbroking Firm, Brun Shipbrokers, I think that's right. And then last but certainly not least, Francis Saar from CMB in Belgium, who's actually the, uh, the chairman of this uh, particular project team. So they're all here to explain a little bit about the project. Also on the stage here, we have my colleague, Casper uh, Grispo from uh, BIMCO. Uh, his task here today is to drive SmartCom. So what we thought we'd do in order to help illustrate this new contract is to actually put it on the screen for you and work through a few examples so you can see how it actually works in practice. Um, it is a modern document, so it's a digital document, so it does things in SmartCon that you, uh, don't actually happen in paper, so I think it's really important that you understand and see how things will actually work out in practice. Uh, my name is Grant Hunter, I'm from the BIMCO Secretariat. I was very fortunate uh, to get to work with these four gentlemen and the six other members of the uh, subcommittee, I think there are, some of these are joining online today as well, in the two years it took to develop the ship sale agreement. Uh, it was quite a challenging task, made even more challenging by the pandemic, meaning that quite often we had to meet online. Uh, occasionally we did get to meet, and I think it's quite remarkable that they managed to produce a first-class product basically based on the fact that we just gave them a couple of hot meals and lots of hot coffee during the process. Um, but they worked very hard through this, they worked online, uh, they're a really, really dedicated team, and I think they've actually produced an excellent contract. Now, part of the process that BIMCO uses when developing these contracts, of course, it's, it's one thing for the drafting team to come up with their ideas, but we need to engage with the industry as well. So a very important part of this process was a consultation exercise where we went out to the industry and we showed them quite an advanced draft of what we produced and got their feedback. And we actually had feedback from over 200 companies and individuals, and I think there's something like over 800, maybe 853 individual comments that we processed. But it's a very important part of this because we wanted the industry to make sure that they have buy into this, that they're hearing their views, what they consider to be a good contract. And that was a very, very important part of the process. It took a long time to process all these comments, but it just shows it's a very, very thorough process that we go through here when we're developing a contract by BIMCO. I think the end result is a very good, it's a modern and comprehensive and relevant new ship sale agreement. Um, I think from my point of view, I've just got a very simple message for you that ship sale 22 is a better document than whatever ship sale agreement you're using at the moment. And the purpose of this seminar here today is to ask these gentlemen to explain why that is. So we're gonna start off with Matt, who's gonna run you through the contract. We'll just go each of the clauses, just give you um, a, a guiding sort of note as to how the contract's actually structured and how it works. And then we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into each of the clauses as we go along. Um, in terms of questions, uh, we can take questions for those of you online, if you tap something into the chat section, um, and either, other than that, we'll take uh, questions from the audience. Um, if you can let Matt do his first run through first, and then as we go into the various clauses, you're free to sort of chip in with questions as we go along. And at the end, we'll also have a, a Q&A session as well. So let me hand you over to, to Matt. Uh, thank you, Grant. Um, so as Grant said, um, I've got the uh, pleasure of walking you through the uh, ship cell 22. Um, it's going to be a very quick canter through. I'm not going to linger on the clauses, just a few highlights of each clause. The point being to give you an idea of the structure um, of the document and a little bit of familiarity. Um, as we go along, for certain clauses, as Grant also said, Casper is going to help me um, show how we can complete and amend um, uh, Ship Cell 22. So hopefully there'll be a bit of an interactive element to it as well. So to start with, um, let's talk about the structure. Um, we have uh, two parts to Ship Sail 22, part one, which is the box format, and part two, which contains the standard terms and conditions. There are also some annexes at the back, which we will come to um, when we get to that point. So part one, part one is a box format. Most people who use BIMCO forms will be familiar with the box format. The idea is that um, parties can see the key terms of the transaction at a glance. So to start with, let's start this interactive element, um, Casper. So let's just put in a few things, just, just to get an illustrative example about how it works. So we're gonna call the vessel 
for the purposes of this uh, seminar, MV Bimco Voyager. And let's assume that the date of the agreement is today's date, the 28th of May. We've prepared it. Um, so let's, let's do that. Now, the next thing I just wanted to talk about was guarantors. Um, you'll see at boxes five and six that ship sale 22 contemplates the possibility that the obligations of the buyer and the seller may be guaranteed. Um, so if that's the case, then you can see that boxes five and six ask for the parties to fill in the name and address of those guarantors. And later at the bottom of, box, uh, of the boxes, um, if you go down, Casper, uh, to the signature part, you'll see that, that the guarantors can also sign the guarantee, uh, the uh, ship sale 22, um, and bind themselves to it. Alternatively, as we know, it is frequent where guarantees are in place that rather than um, just simply signing up to the guarantee by virtue of their signature to this form, um, the guarantee will be a separate instrument, in which case the names and details of the guarantors would go into box five and six, or as applicable, but then they, the signing would be actually on a separate guarantee instrument. As we know, more often than not, there aren't any guarantors for these types of um, agreement. Um, again, just for illustrative purposes, it's always best practice, whether in this contract or any other, when the box is not to leave them blank, but actually to fill them in. So here in boxes five and six, that's where let's put not applicable or NA to make it absolutely clear that the intention of the parties is that there's no guarantor. The final thing I'll do for a bit of completion of this is just to talk right to the bottom down to clause 24. It says here numbers of any additional clauses. It says numbers rather than number. So what you would hear if we had, for example, three additional clauses, um, there are 27 standard clauses in the printed terms. So if we had three additional clauses, what we would insert here is 28 to 30 inclusive. Thank you. So that's, that's your part one. I would say the last comment I'd make on the boxes is at the bottom um, underneath directly. There we are. Um, we've got, uh, here we go. If you look at the where it says authentic BIMCO template, you'll see that there is a confirmation that if there is a conflict between the terms of part one and the terms of part two, it's the terms of part one which will prevail um, in the event of a conflict. So we'll come back to fill in some more boxes a little bit later as we go along, but let's now move into part two of the standard terms. So the first clause is a fairly comprehensive definitions and interpretation clause. Um, if we go down to the bottom of that clause, Casper, you'll see um, that uh, B, C, and D. In D, it also confirms that capitalized terms used in the boxes will also be defined terms when they're used throughout part two of the contract. I'm gonna take this opportunity also to show now how we amend the uh, form by using the example of delivery documents. So here, if you look at the definition of delivery documents, you'll see that it's the documents that are listed in Annex A to the agreement. If we could go to Annex A very quickly. So Annex A, here we provide, ship sale 22 provides a list. It's in three parts. Part one is the documents that the seller will be need to provide at delivery. Part two is the documents that the buyer is required to provide at delivery. And there is a part three, just confirming the protocol of delivery and acceptance to be signed um, in accordance with clause 16D to where the parties confirm the time, date, place that delivery and transfer of title takes place. So if we go back to that definition, Casper, as we know, it's common in ship sale transactions for the parties not to use the list that's contained in standard form, but rather to negotiate the list separately and include it in an addendum. So by way of showing how the, amend, uh, the form can be amended, 
here we need to make two amendments. The first is to amend the definition of delivery documents. So now we'll see that it's, we've got delivery documents means the document set out in addendum one to this agreement. And then secondly, there would be then to delete the applicable parts of Annex A. So we would take out part one, part two. And if the protocol of delivery acceptance is being referred to and dealt with in the addendum, we would take out part three. So that's hopefully very simple and straightforward and shows clearly how the amendment will look on the, on the form. So if we go now to clause two. So clause two, sale and purchase. This is just telling us right up front what's included in the sale and not included in the sale. Obviously we have the ship itself, but we've also got the concept of included items. It's, I won't go through the definition, but essentially it's what's on board at the time of the inspection, or if there's no inspection, the date of the agreement, unless those items have been expressly excluded. So excluded items has, is Annex B. So Casper, if you could go to Annex B, and let's imagine for our illustrative example that we are going to exclude um, gas bottles. You've got the thing ready to put in there. So you would put those gas bottles, 12 um, gas bottles, and the video tell, they're the examples commonly used. Once those have been placed in uh, Annex B, the effect is that they are no longer part of the sale and the seller is not required to provide them or replace them at the time of delivery. If you don't put it in the excluded items list, then woe betide the, the seller as they will then have obligations to provide or replace. Clause three, please, Casper. So clause three, uh, we hope is a, a very useful feature. This is a subjects clause. As we all know, it is common for parties to sign the ship sale agreement um, on the basis that they do not intend it to become legally effective until one or more subjects have been uh, lifted, uh, conditions being satisfied. So how, how do we do this? So if Casper, you go to the subjects box in part one, There we are in box 25. So let's, for our example, it's one of the most common subjects that need to be lifted before parties want to enter into a signing contract is um, board approval. So for our example, we are going to have the buyer's approval of their board of directors. And as we'll see, the box 25 requires the parties also to put in a latest date for that subject to be lifted. So in this case, if we go back, that's what we that clause two, three, sorry. Um, at that point, we'll see that those subjects need to be lifted by that date. If they're not lifted, the contract becomes null and void. Clause four, purchase price. It simply it gives its own clause, sets out what the, per, that the purchase price is actually the sum payable for the vessel and the included items. And it also makes a confirmatory statement that while the bunkers, oils and greases are included in the sale, they are not included in the purchase price and that will be determined in accordance with clause 13. I think as, a, as an overall point, I would say that here by clause four, we actually understand and we've got a whole structure of the deal. We know what's included, what's excluded, what the price is, and we also, at this point, know at what point the contract is intended to become effective. And this was very much part of the, if you like, the approach taken to follow a very logical sequence, um, as we'll now see as we go through the next set of clauses. So now we've got clause five, which is the deposit clause, um, following the, the, the standard uh, market position. Um, I think that um, there is a new feature, which I believe Francis, you were talking about, which we call the disruptive banking event um, clause. Um, but I'll let Francis talk about that. So we've got our deposit, and then we move on to our um, 
before we go to the inspection, actually, let's do a couple more boxes, just to fill it in. So um, let's look at the purchase price and let's call that 10 million dollars. Okay, so that's going on there. And the deposit, well, let's, as we know, the usual fallback is 10%, not always these days, but let's use the most commonly um, adopted percentage for there. So there we've got that filled in there. Good. So if we can go back to the bills, thank you, Kesper, you're keeping up very well. So now we've got the, um, the inspection. So here we've got, this is the initial inspection. Um, there are three options. Um, either um, the most commonly uh, adopted uh, inspection regime is the pre-contractual uh, inspection. So in other words, it's been done before the contract is signed. That's 6A. 6B is where the parties have agreed that the inspection will take place after the contract is signed, usually shortly after. And 6C, track down a little bit, is the circumstances where the parties have agreed to dispense with the initial um, uh, inspection. Um, classically, because, for instance, the uh, buyer may be a uh, bareboat charterer who's been operating the vessel for some time and is familiar with it. So you have three choices. Um, let's see how it works, Casper, with the box. And I think this is box eight. So in, in our case, again, let's go with the most commonly chosen one. In this case, 6A, the pre-contractual inspection. So we select 6A. And then at this point, we would want to then, in accordance with the clause, let set out when the uh, inspection took place and where. And in this example, we've used, I think, the 30th of April, and the inspection took place in Singapore. So we'll start to see some shape to this document. Um, now, if we go to um, the next clause, So then seven, we've got the buyer's reps clause. The only comment I'll make on this is that we've pushed this right up to the front. Um, so in logical sequence, obviously, we know that the buyer's reps entitlement to go on board the vessel is normally after the payment of the deposit. So we've placed this close to that um, soon after the deposit clause and the inspection clause in circumstances where there is a post-contractual inspection. Um, clause eight. Um, now we're into the underwater inspection. Um, the only comments I'll make on this, because I believe, Christoph, you'll be talking about this, is that Clause 8 and Clause 9, the dry docking clause, are separate clauses. So the only thing I'll do here is on the interactive basis is to show how this will work. So essentially, when we get to the, uh, the boxes, um, Box 17 asks the parties to, to determine and insert whether they want to go for the regime where the vessel um, is subject to a diver's inspection and only if the diver's inspection results in uh, damage affecting class the underwater parts, will it then go into dry dock. In that case, you would select clause eight and that regime will then take place. That's the one we'll do here. Obviously in those less common circumstances where the vessel is going straight into dry dock, obviously you would then choose clause nine. So if we go back to um, the clauses again. So then we move now, we've had our, we've had our inspection, we've, uh, underwater inspection, we've had our dry docking. These next clauses now are focusing and honing in on that key moment of delivery where we have movement for the physical handover and transfer of legal title in the vessel. So key clause um, is condition of the vessel at delivery. In ship sale 22, we have effectively combined both the physical conditionality obligations and what I'll call the legal conditionality. So not only do we have all of those great things about the vessel being as she was, or it was at the time of inspection, uh, free of average damage affecting class, but we've also, as we work up, got our legal um, warranties and indemnities in respect of uh, claims and encumbrances. So on to clause 11. So now we're moving 
closer to the delivery point. This clause 11 is dedicated to delivery notices. So we have our usual uh, pre-delivery notices, the narrowing window we get as the vessel gets closer to the delivery point, and then the notice of readiness where the vessel um, is at the place of delivery and the seller is ready in all respects with the vessel physically ready for delivery. Um, the key feature here, we've got, again, part of the approach that Ship Sale 22 takes is really to be very, very comprehensive in spelling out to the parties exactly where things are. Here's a good example in C that we have a complete list of all of the conditions that must be satisfied before NOR can be validly given. Clause 12, vessel delay. Um, the only comment I'll, I'll, I'll make on that um, is that um, we, uh, we have the uh, link through to the, um, the fact that clause uh, 19 will apply in the event that the, thing, uh, that the contract is terminated. So we'll get to clause 19 in a moment. But other than that, I think it follows the market uh, standard practice. Um, bunkers, oils, and greases. Um, again, this is going to be um, talked about by John. Are you talking about that one? So I will, I will pass on from that. But again, it's got its own clause. We've housed a number of these clauses, given them dedicated clauses rather than mixing and matching. So there's an example of of that. Um, clause 14, payments. Okay, again, we've given the payments its own dedicated clause. Um, I don't think there's anything particular for us to say on that one, apart from we can work it through. Um, but it then spells out the usual. Obviously, here, there is an assumption that the deposit, as well as being um, acting as security for the performance of the buyer's obligations, it's also, um, as is common, um, acts as part payment of the price, so the deposit will be released and the buyer will be obliged then to remit the balance and all other sums that are due at delivery. Delivery documents, we've spoken about delivery documents um, here, it has a, it's a two-part clause, again we've given it its own clause, the first part talks about the timing for exchanging copies, drafts and samples, and the second clause um, at 15b, talks about what one does if those documents um, are not in the English language. So we've moved up in these clauses right up to the moment, and now we've got to that key moment of delivery. So here we have a delivery clause talking about the process where physical possession and legal transfer will take place. Clause 17, again, another effectively dedicated clause giving some obligations for both the seller and the buyer post delivery. We then have our seller's termination rights. So obviously the main thing being if the buyer either fails to pay the deposit within the specified time or having paid the deposit, fails to take delivery and pay for the vessel um, within the specified time. And then obviously at 19, we have the reciprocal clause for the buyer's termination rights if the seller is fa fails to be ready to give notice of readiness um, by the cancelling date or is not ready to validly complete a legal transfer by the cancelling date. Clause 20, total loss, um, standard, standard clause. If the vessel suffers a total loss before delivery, then if there's been a deposit has been paid, it will be returned and thereafter the contract will be null and void. 21. Uh, we have, a, we think, an interesting new feature showing, hopefully, the modern nature of this document. As we, do, as we all know now, it is absolutely standard to have these regulatory-style clauses in. So 21 and 22 is sanctions and anti-corruption, and Francis will be making some observations on those clauses. We've also included a confidentiality clause. Um, this was something that was... Um, from the sounding board that Grant talked about, we had a lot of comments asking that for, for a, a confidentiality clause to be included. Um, but the overwhelming um, response from the sounding board was that while it was important to have a confidentiality clause, a breach of confidentiality should not uh, enable the innocent party to terminate the contract. So that's the, the style. It may well be that there are circumstances where parties wish to amend that to create firmer obligations, 
but that is what the standard printed terms say in ship sale 22. 24, notices and communications. So here, um, the parties are invited to insert the contact details in boxes 21 and 22. The one comment I would make for this is there is an exception that where notices or communications are being given in respect of arbitration proceedings, there is a separate notices provision within the law and arbitration clause, and I'll come to that when we get to the final clause. Um, so then we have our entire agreement clause. Um, this now familiar, we understand that the basic principle being that the contract represents the entire agreement of the parties. Um, it's a comprehensive clause, both to deal with representations that are made prior to the contract and also to disapply statutory implied terms in both cases to the extent permitted by law. Let's now go to the law and arbitration clause. So I think the best way to describe this, the, the default position under ship cell 22, the default position is that the agreement will be governed by English law and London arbitration, LMAA. Um, and as we can see, that's how it's set out here. However, through the, the magic of SmartCon, there is there are a number of options that the par parties can choose if they do not want English law to apply. So we go to our boxes and we go to box 26. And when you drop down your options, you'll see that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, well, seven if you include other. So there is the option for English law, US law, Singapore arbitration, Hong Kong arbitration. So if you wish one of these, you select it. Let's go for US law, Casper. Once you've plugged that in and saved it, the magic of SmartCon then works. And if we return to our clause 26, or clause 27, clause 26, you'll see that by saving that option for US law, the clause has automatically changed. And now we've got the New York arbitration clause included. Um, and in each case, um, there will be um, opportunity for uh, small or intermediate claims where the size of the claim and the counterclaim um, do, do not merit a full arbitration. So, so I think that, that, that's, a, that's a useful feature. I think it's easy to use. You make it look easy to use, Casper, but I think it is, it's intuitive and it's good. So we get to the final clause. Um, um, again, I think, Francis, you're gonna, uh, are you talking about the electronics? Yes, you're going to talk about this, so I don't think. So, so all I will say, all I will say on, on that one is, again, um, we're all finding, not just with ship sale, but with all our contracts, that um, more and more um, electronic signatures are being used. Um, so, um, again, I hope this is a, a good feature for the contract, not just for today, but moving forward. Thank you very much. I shall introduce John Varley. Thank you, Matt. Um, having been a sell and purchase broker for quite a few years, I'm fully aware that the sales form is not necessarily a priority in the working day for a broker. I know that many times uh, in a competitive situation that we often have to persuade a buyer to agree sellers issued terms and sometimes pick up the pieces later. But that doesn't detract from the importance of having a standard sale form that we can use as a basis for sale and purchase. A form that is hopefully logical and fair to both sides. A form which is hopefully up to date uh, and already includes clauses which we often have to incorporate later into MOAs. And therefore, hopefully, the transformation between recap of terms to signed MOA does not require lengthy delays and renegotiations. Uh, a few illustrations where we have a fresh approach, and there might be an element of repetition from Matt here, but, uh, uh, and or additional clauses. Um, if we turn to clause three, uh, the subjects clause, um, which is a new additional clause. Um, it is not unusual uh, when dealing with clients uh, that subjects to the deal are required, uh, quoted companies, corporations, tenders, state-related entities uh, may require internal approval before proceeding with the deal. 
So the type of subjects would commonly be sellers or buyers board approval, which may relate to financing or finding suitable employment. Here we give allowance for both buyers and sellers subjects to be listed uh, in box uh, 25 of part one of the sales form uh, with the clear state subjects, if any, and latest date with which subjects must be lifted. Uh, obviously, uh, if this is left blank, then there are no applicable subjects. Balls clearly states that if subjects are not lifted by and within the state, then the contract should be null and void. And neither party shall have any claim against the other party, and both parties shall immediately be relieved of any obligations and liabilities to the other party under or in connection with this agreement. Um, if the parties are not contracting under English law, they should check with the relevant jurisdiction, uh, as other jurisdictions may determine there is a binding agreement, even when all subjects have not been lifted. However, clause 23, confidentiality, and 26, law and arbitration, shall survive this agreement, i.e. they shall remain in place and adhere to. Um, and clause 13, uh, bunkers, oils, and greases. Um, in other sales forms, uh, the bunkers clause is uh, lumped in uh, with spares and other items. Uh, in the ship sale 22 form, it is given a distinct and separate clause. Uh, the first and important differential is the requirement uh, prior to delivery, there should be a joint survey by the parties to establish the quantities of the bunkers, oil and greases. Of course, this is logical, and in most cases, normal standard practice. But it is often not stated, but we hope it is seen as an important and useful addition. Uh, of course, uh, this doesn't take into consideration uh, the difference in quantities between the time of the survey and the time of delivery. Any consumption should be accounted for in the final calculations. Uh, to avoid any misunderstandings, the definitions of parties, being sellers and buyers, is covered under definitions and interpretation under one as are bunkers, being bunkers uh, on board. Uh, the vessel of delivery and oils and greases means unused lubricating hydraulic and thermal oils, unused greases in the vessel's designated storage tanks, and in uh, unopened drums, cans, or containers on board the vessel of delivery. Again, after consultation, we've gone into a little bit more detail incorporating hydraulic and thermal oils. In other forms, this clause is worded in such a way that inevitably the clause has to be redrafted for the executed document, i.e. bunkers and lube oil prices are linked together. In the ship sale 22 form, the two are separated, i.e. B for bunkers and C for oils and greases. Uh, with respect to bunker price evidence, uh, as well as invoices and vouchers, we've also included charter party statement of accounts. Uh, we're aware that in many instances, the relevant bunker prices are back to back with redelivery from a charter. Uh, and therefore, the relevant bunker prices should be evidenced by a charter party statement of accounts. Uh, the reference uh, to prices in plural is to ensure that sellers do not apply one price in circumstances where they pay different prices for different amounts. Uh, we've also used the word latest instead of current which we believe is more appropriate and not ambiguous. Uh, we have used excluding barging expenses uh, with relevance to bunkers and excluding delivery costs uh, with relevance to lube wars, which we believe is also more relevant. Uh, the agreed alternative is selected in 18, uh, box 18, um, with a provision that in the unlikely scenario it is left blank in 13B1 and 13C1 shall apply, that is net prices paid by the sellers as evidenced. Uh, if, of course, specific prices are agreed during the negotiation, these can simply be inserted in box 18. Then we have clause 23, confidentiality. Um, uh, again, some form of uh, sorry, confidentiality clause is inevitably included in an MOA. And here we have drafted what we believe should cover most eventualities. Um, in our clause, we've taken into account that if required by law or stock exchange authority, or indeed to perform some obligations under the agreement, it may be necessary to use some form of the contents of the agreement, but it must always be treated confidentially. Of course, um, in the vast majority of sales, a breach of confidentiality should not be considered 
as a route to terminate the deal. And hence, in our clause, a breach should not give either party the right to terminate this agreement, but confidentiality is considered by most to be informed. However, speaking as a sell and purchase broker, I've always found confidentiality clause somewhat at odds with the workings of the sell and purchase market. The sell and purchase market, as most of you know, works on precedent, the price achieved on the sale of one vessel, sets the market for the sale of the next comparable vessel. Market reports are produced daily and weekly, and the information in respect to prices achieved, uh, which rarely completely verified, is used to set the market. If no sales market, uh, sorry, now if sales information leaked, there'd be no market. On the other hand, buyers and sellers rarely wish information to come into the market, so it is important to include confidentiality clause, which may prevent premature leakage of such information. Uh, the identity of the actual buyer may be particularly sensitive. Often buyers uh, do not wish to be known to be in the market or sellers may not wish the market to know they're selling. A confidentiality clause often ensures accurate information about a sale is not reported and delays the reporting of a sale. Uh, but on the other hand, it is almost inevitable that a sale is reported at some point, but the actual details may well remain confidential. Um, but as mentioned uh, earlier, it is vitally important in the vast majority of sales that the parties cannot terminate the agreement due to a breach of confidentiality. Otherwise, it could be certainly misused to frustrate a deal. Yes, a warm welcome also from my side. Good morning and uh, thanks for your attendance here and uh, of course also online. Uh, like John, I'm coming from the practical side. I'm an S&P broker since many years. And so we are focusing our work in this group on the practical issues uh, and the situations that uh, we have to deal with in most of the cases during the negotiations in order to guide our clients into a good contract, as uh, John correctly said, um, but also then being safe for special situations when they occur prior to delivery. So this is why my little baby is the underwater inspection since many years. And I want to highlight a few things which hopefully uh, show that ShipSail 22 has become uh, very clear and um, as you have also seen very much structured, but hopefully also clarifies a few things that in practice over the last years have raised some problems or discussions, arguments, or even worse. So as you will have seen, um, we have uh, clearly separated these two scenarios into two separate uh, clauses with their own regime and avoiding a big clause with all kinds of subclauses that are interlinked and so on. But um, for the contract, we and the parties usually decide what they want to do, uh, either an underwater inspection, which is the more popular uh, scenario and decision or a dry dock. So this is being decided and ticked in, uh, and, 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 and clarified in box 17. Um, where you just insert either eight or nine, uh, subject to your decision. But also, unlike in the past, there's no need to delete the other alternative just because you have chosen number eight, for example. And uh, probably even more uh, importantly, you should not delete this because if you can just quickly move to 9A, uh, 9A, stipulates when the dry dock clause should come into effect. And this means it can stand there undeleted and it should stay there undeleted um, to, be, uh, to be clear because in certain situations, even if you have chosen the underwater inspection, situations could arise which may need the dry dock inspection uh, become effective. Now, going back to eight now, just highlight a few things. Um, in 8A, we have 
no option for the buyers to decide whether or not he wants to do an underwater inspection. Um, it is clearly an automatic obligation from the seller to make the ship available for this inspection, because we thought that any decent buyer would probably know at the time of negotiations or latest when signing the MOA uh, that he wants to do this. Um, so why not making it clear from the beginning? Um, so again, something which gives a little bit more clarity and avoidance of, of uh, discussions. Then we have something in clause, sub clause D, the place of delivery. Um, again, we want to be clearer here. There was in previous forms some hidden hint where it was assumed that this place where the dry underwater inspection should take place should be the place of delivery. Um, but now it's clear it shall be at the place of delivery and only in cases where the class requires to go to a different place because the circumstances may not be um, suitable for an underwater inspection or the parties agree um, otherwise uh, it can be at a different place. And a different place could also be subject to agreement, of course, maybe the last port uh, before the uh, ship arrives at the place of delivery, or even combine the inspection from the buyers of the ship uh, together with an underwater inspection, which also happens occasionally. Then in subclause E, just a small remark that we have suggested, I would say, that a representative, meaning one, uh, of the buyer shall be um, attending the underwater inspection, can be one of the two that are on board maybe already uh, after the deposit has been lodged, or it can be someone, uh, some other uh, uh, surveyor from the buyer's side. But that avoids uh, the misunderstandings which came up when the buyer sent three, four people to, to join this underwater inspection, which of course uh, is, not good. Um, G. Okay. Now this is um, something I have to go back a little bit in history um, because it's now finally clear as I think, as we think in all respects. Uh, you remember that um, in previous forms, there was no clear uh, instruction when could the sellers tender the notice of readiness. Uh, before the underwater inspection, because the ship is ready and it was just an option from the buyers to do this, or only after a successful uh, underwater inspection. Um, so this has been revised in the meantime, as you know. So the sellers can only tender the notice of readiness once the underwater inspection has been done successfully. But what has not been discussed and, and uh, stipulated is what would be the consequences if the buyers, for any reasons, whatever, uh, fail to arrange this underwater inspection timely um, once the vessel has arrived at the place of the underwater inspection. And that in turn leaves the seller unable to uh, tender the notice of readiness. So, there was a little remark that the inspection should not be, uh, that the inspection should be arranged without undue delay, as you remember. But in, uh, we thought in the worst case, that wouldn't cover the, the seller's position uh, if, for example, the buyers simply fail to do this. Now, this has now been uh, made clear in that in the subclauses one and two, um, the, um, the buyers who in the end are responsible for arranging the underwater inspection as we see in subclause C, which is not on screen right now, but you can see it there. So the buyers are responsible for arranging the underwater inspection, but if, they, if there is a delay, they do this. Um, there are two scenarios, either um, 
the uh, underwater inspection has commenced but uh, was not completed so then within two days um, uh, this failure clause let's say would come into effect or in the worst case for the buyers would lead to a loss of the uh, right to do this underwater inspection if within the two days that we have suggested for that delay um, the um, underwater inspection has not even commenced so again we think this gives ship sale uh, a much clearer um, uh, position for the for the sellers and it puts also the buyers under a certain pressure and obligation to make sure that the arrangements for the underwater inspection um, are made without time loss and delaying the delivery. So then some small remarks on J. So we, we um, I have to say before the, can you mark the I to J, uh, to, to K? So we, we, you remember that we have, that there was um, the situation introduced that you have the underwater inspection, the class finds the damage. Uh, the damage does not necessarily have to be repaired uh, before next dry docking. That was introduced because the market uh, suggested it and uh, it should avoid delays on the delivery process and give the, both parties the possibility to agree on a deduction of the purchase price uh, equivalent, equivalent to the costs for these repairs. And in order to achieve that amount, you can either try to mutually agree on it, or if that fails, um, you have to obtain quotes from shipyards nearby. So that was the scenario that we have been, uh, that, that there is. Uh, in the industry, uh, and it, I think it's being used quite uh, often in practice if there's damage found. Now in the I to K, what we have um, done is um, we widened the possibilities for the parties to obtain these quotes and added uh, repair yards, repair uh, facilities, sorry in addition to shipyards, because we know not every place of delivery uh, has a shipyard, but maybe it has a repair facility. So that gives both parties a little bit more, uh, a wider uh, um, choice of uh, getting these quotes. And we have given both parties three banking days to obtain these quotes in case they cannot agree otherwise. Now for the same part in K, we have brought in a new idea in that we say, okay, if there is a class damage found and the parties decide to find uh, agreement on the deduction of the purchase price, um, the canceling date should automatically be extended by the, the three, by three banking days, which are the three banking days that we have given the parties to uh, obtain the quotes to be in a fair situation in case the delivery or the underwater inspection is so very close to the um, uh, to the canceling date. So that we see in, uh, in K. Um, good. Then we move to clause uh, nine as only two small remarks I want to make. I mean, in, I already mentioned in clause uh, 9a, when does this clause come into effect? So this should stay. Nothing in this clause should be, or the clause should not be deleted just because you are choosing eight uh, as the first choice. Um, in uh, D, we have extended the canceling date for the case that the ship needs to find a dry dock elsewhere than the place of delivery to 21 days. And in I, as we thought also uh, uh, important, we have no more, no, I shouldn't say no more, but the buyers have no 
right or option to uh, request the sellers to have the tail shaft drawn prior to delivery. Only it remains uh, valid only for the situation that the class wants that. And um, as we think again, a clearer and more independent uh, um, decision um, made by by class and uh, avoids possible delays if and when the buyers come up with such a request very late in the delivery process. So, and then I was asked to to say a little bit about the clause fourteen, but there's not very much really. Uh, Grant has already pointed that out. Um, just to say in general that following the logic and the and the concept of of the wholesale form uh, of the ship sale twenty two we have tried to or we have not tried we have put together all the money relevant items that one or the other party has to pay into one clause rather than finding it uh, distributed over the contract so this is what uh, clause fourteen uh, follows um, and uh, the other little remark I wanted to make is on C, where we have again tried to more comprehensively describe the situation that whatever deductions there could be on the way from the funds being sent on the way to the seller's account uh, that the buyers have to uh, compensate same um, or the, the paying party has to compensate those deductions which occur on the way uh, during the transmittance. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Christoph, just before you sit down. No, it's just serious. No, we just had a question from one of our um, oh, yeah, yeah, online yeah, participants, yeah. and it was just due with the underwater inspection clause. Uh, and I think it's probably a appropriate time to ask you now, but uh, under eight, uh, clause 8G Roman 2, uh, the question is, is the cancelling date extended by the amount of days over the two days allowed, or is it the total amount of time taken? Say again, in... in is the extended, uh, sorry, is the cancelling day extended by the amount of days over the two days allowed, or is it the total amount of time taken? Is it added to that? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you very much. Um, Matt, I would think it uh, should be um, additional time to be completed. Uh, it should be adding up after the two days. Because if, if we say um, shall be extended by the additional time taken for the underwater inspection to be completed, and it has uh, already commenced, then I would think that uh, you have the two days, you find out it's not working out, and then it's from day three, um, the cancelling date shall be extended until it's completed. Lovely. Thank you, Christoph. And I noticed a nod from the jury as well, so that's good. And the good news is we're receiving lots of questions online, so we're going to be keeping you busy after, you've, after Francis finishes. I think so. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Christoph. Right, I've, I've got a little goodies bag for you and some uh, novelties um, in this uh, ship sale 22 that you can't find in sale form. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the deposit clause, then I'll come on to sanctions and anti-corruption, and then I'll finish with something about um, electronic signatures, which is a bit flavor of the day, I think. But um, starting off with uh, the deposit clause, Casper, uh, if you could just highlight uh, 5C, there we go. Um, as you can see, there is a new concept there. Uh, we're talking about the deposit holding agreement, something which wasn't in sale form 2012. Um, and the deposit holding agreement is, is something which is, has become standard. So we felt it was necessary to actually provide for this uh, in this sale form. And what it does, it basically uh, provides the basis upon which the uh, deposit is received, held and released. Um, for example, it will deal with um, 
the fees to be paid, when the interest has to be returned and to whom it has to be returned, and when the deposit is released, for example, upon present presentation of a PDA or an unappealable final arbitration award. So that's uh, one of the new things that we've uh, put in here, which is basically just following standard procedures that already exist. So if we can now move down a little bit, uh, because now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we thought was uh, something that we had to um, introduce for the buyers, a sort of a, a safety net for the buyers. Um, that's good. That's excellent. Yep. Um, the safety net that we've introduced for the buyers is basically if there's a problem with uh, pushing the money through the banking system, something might go wrong, which is beyond uh, the buyer's control. And we thought that we might have to give buyers some, uh, some um, respite um, to make sure that um, he isn't penalized too much under clause 18. Uh, clause 18 is the draconian um, uh, situation that can occur if the buyer is in breach of paying the deposit. He would then have to pay compensation to the sellers. So to blunt that a little bit, we've introduced what we would call the disruptive banking event, um, which is defined in the clause. And I think you can see there uh, a failure in the banking system, uh, an oversight or error on the part of the buyer's bank, or a review by the deposit holders bank. And all of these are defined as a disruptive banking event. And what happens then if something happens in the system that the buyers uh, uh, weren't responsible for, then the buyers get two extra banking days within which to uh, remit the deposit. So that's um, a really nice feature for the buyers. I think it was something that we thought was necessary just to blunt the effects of uh, clause 18. So I think we can move on now to sanctions, which is clause uh, 21, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I'm gonna take these two together, sanctions and anti-corruption. Um, sanctions and anti-corruption, well, to start off with, the sanctions clause is a, is a version or an amended version of the already existing uh, BIMCO clauses, uh, sanctions clauses for time charters and uh, voyage charters 2020. So a little plug there for those uh, two clauses for those uh, wishing to insert those into their charter parties. But talking about sale and purchase here, um, we've slightly amended uh, those uh, clauses to apply to a sale and purchase agreement. Um, and as you can see, there are some def definitions, sanctioned activity, sanctioned authority, uh, which is quite wide. It doesn't, it's not restricted to United Nations, European Union, the US, as you sometimes see. It's, it's a, broader, a broader definition. And it's a very objective test that is applied in terms of breaching sanctions. And there's a warranty there. The parties warrant that they are not a sanctioned party acting as a principal and not as an agent or trustee or nominee of any person who's a sanctioned party. And then you have what are the effects of a breach of this clause? Well, then there's the, uh, the right to terminate and or claim damages uh, from the breach. Moving on then to anti-corruption. Very, very simple clause. It just uh, provides the, for a indemnity if there's a breach of any anti-corruption legislation and also touches on the point that if uh, one of the parties is in breach of anti-corruption legislation and causes the other party to be in breach of the of anti-corruption uh, legislation, then there's the option to terminate um, or claim damages uh, resulting from the breach of those regulations. What you don't see here is uh, anti-money um, laundering uh, provisions. We've kept those out those will normally be dealt with separately by the parties in conjunction with their legal advisors and the banks. So we didn't want to over-legislate, uh, and that's the reason why AML is not um, in this uh, form. So now we can move on to the end, to electronic signatures, the flavor of the day. Everybody likes an electronic signature. Um, I do, anyway. Uh, it makes my life a lot easier. So I don't have to move, I can sit behind my computer and just sort of sign documents. It's very, very easy. And it's actually something that um, was used a lot uh, during the lockdowns that we've uh, had over the last couple of years. 
it's been easy just to sit you know behind your computer or wherever you are all over the world and sign a document electronically we've dealt with that this here it 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 basically means that you can sign something a document this document um, electronically and it doesn't affect the validity what we have done we've also um, in i think it's in c yes in c we've carved out the yes thank you casper for highlighting that in c there we've, we've provided for a carve out if for example your bill of sale the registering authority uh, for a bill of sale requires you to have uh, an original handwritten signature then uh, we've provided for this carve out here in um, c 27 c so that's all i really wanted to say i mean these are just sort of uh, new things that we've uh, introduced uh, some novelties um, clauses which make it a lot more modern um, especially the electronic signature clause it's just something that um, makes it really up to date and, and a very easy thing to use and casper was mentioning to me earlier sign is something that's widely used uh, you also have this public key encryption technology, which you probably use to um, to fill in your tax forms. Um, uh, that's what I use anyway when I fill in my tax form. Uh, so it's all very, very easy nowadays. And this basically just means that everything now um, can be done electronically and doesn't affect the validity. It's accepted as a, a, an electronically signed uh, document is accepted as being perfectly uh, valid. So um, I think that's me done. And I think now we're going to move on to questions and answers. Grant, oh, is, that, is that where we are? Are there any questions for me or for the panel? Uh, yeah, you actually, I've got one, a quick question. You've got a quick question before you sort of go okay. back to your seat. Yeah. It was just that you're, you're talking about the anti technicality provision. Yep. And the question is why does it only apply to the deposit and not to the balance of the sale and purchase price? Yeah, I think that's a very, very good question. We did actually uh, look at that um, question when we drafted um, this form. And we thought it was appropriate to have it um, have this anti-technicality applied to the deposit and not to the balance of the purchase price. And the reason for that is when you're getting towards the end of the sale process, uh, more towards delivery, parties are more focused on getting things right. And uh, the KYC has already been done. KYC is something that might uh, hold up a payment that's already been tested and done uh, when opening uh, the deposit. Um, and secondly, another reason why we didn't apply it to or wouldn't apply it to the uh, balance of the purchase price is because potentially you could have a massive exposure for the seller um, in that his asset is there waiting to be delivered to the buyer. And it could be sitting there for maybe 10 days if you add up all the days, the banking days, the three banking days, then the two extra days that we've uh, granted for the deposit. You could have the asset sitting there for quite some time and expose the sellers um, to uh, considerable losses, uh, which you don't have, obviously, when you are opening the deposit. The, the, the sale has just started. So that's uh, basically the answer to that question. I hope that's a satisfactory answer. Yep. I'm entirely satisfied, Francis. Yeah, are you yeah, satisfied? Right. Yeah, I'm satisfied. So you that's are, good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay. So if you like to take your you seat now. Sit down? So, okay. Please sit down, yeah. So uh, thank you very much to our panel. Uh, do you want to come on and say a few words? I'm obviously forgotten you are going to mention something. Oh, exactly. Beg your pardon. Yeah, so what Matt's going to do for us now, before we go into the Q&A, a uh, very important part, is what is not in the contract. Uh, and obviously, this is things we discussed as well, and it was part of the uh, consultation process. People came out with suggestions and things. So there are things we have not included, and Matt is going to explain what those things are and why they aren't included. Uh, thanks, Grant. Um, so just to go back to this consultation process. Um, so as Grant said, 200 plus entities giving comments, 800 plus comments. Um, we did go through them all and we went through them all on, on, on online on Zoom. So it was a, a fairly, fairly um, long, long process. Um, the test that you broadly apply, um, I think is, is, is as follows that, first of all, you're looking at the comments and the most important thing is, are they of general application, sufficiently general that it will be appropriate for a standard form? A lot of comments come in with people who've had particular issues on, or particular problems um, that they would like to be resolved, but they're just simply not general enough to really merit um, uh, going into a standard form. Um, I think the second criteria in a way that we have to look at is, um, are they reflective of market? 
Um, and that's a difficult one. You know, the standard forms are not there to try and change market. They, they're trying to, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing exercise between reflecting market, whatever market is. And there's obviously geographical differences um, and different uh, sectors have different practices. So you've got to draw a line and you don't always get it right for every sector because you can't. Um, and the, the last uh, way we sort of looked at it was, um, is it balanced? Do we think that it's, it's, it creates a balanced position? So you take those three broad criteria and others and apply those to the questions. And on the, on the whole, um, the good news was that the vast majority of comments um, we had considered and we had taken a view, rightly or wrongly, um, so we didn't really get much by way of surprise um, for things that we hadn't at least considered and taken a view on. I think there were two themes which did promote a lot of discussion and a lot of consideration um, and where we'd received um, a fair amount of comments um, for things that uh, should be included in the contract, but which we ultimately decided not to put in ship cell 22. The first, um, Obviously, you have to bear in mind that this discussion was going on in the midst of COVID-19. Um, and therefore, there was um, a lot of requests for whether we should be including either a COVID-19 type clause or more broadly, a force majeure provision. Um, ultimately, we decided that we would not include such a provision, a COVID-19 provision. Um, We'd been obviously, all of us that are working in the industry had been, you know, busy drafting clauses. And the answer is that they were quite specific and they were quite tailored. And when you're producing a standard form, um, you, 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 you've got to be careful about something which is ultimately going to cause more difficulties than it solves because the next event, force majeure event, may not have the same implications and consequences. And this was even more true when it came to the force majeure clause. Um, for those of us that work with shipbuilding contracts, we're very familiar with force majeure and how it works. That is obviously a long-term relationship, which is fully appropriate for there to be force majeure events. Um, we felt that in the context of ship sale and purchase, we had dealt with individual force majeure events, total loss, anti-technicality, the disruptive banking event, um, and even to some extent, the fact that the seller, um, while if, if it fails to deliver, but not through its own negligence, um, the other side, the buyer will be able to terminate, but not claim further compensation. So there is, there is already baked into ship sale 22, specific force majeure type events and consequences. But it was felt that in the context of secondhand ship sales, a general force majeure clause would cause more problems than it would solve um, because it could be open to abuse. So that was the decision that was made, rightly or wrongly, for that theme. The second theme that we have spent a long time thinking about, because a lot of people have pushed very hard for its conclusion, uh, inclusion, was a um, a, a clause dealing with uh, recycling. And the, 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 the common requests here was that the clause should deal with either or both the fact that the vessel is being sold for on trading and should not be um, sold um, and the buyer will not take it away and um, scrap it or recycle it. Or secondly, if they were to do so within the given time, that there should be a clause essentially saying that, that recycling has got to be done in a green, responsible and Hong Kong um, uh, um, convention compliant manner. Now, again, we did think about this and there was a lot of discussion on it, but we eventually came down on the side that we would not include this clause. Um, the reasons for it, I think, were twofold. The first is that we applied the test of how general how generally applicable is this likely to be? Um, and the answer, of course, is that in most cases, um, vast majority of cases, of course, the buyer is buying for trading uh, uh, the, the vessel after taking delivery. The second thing is, what do you put in the clause? 
um, because a lot of people were very keen to have a clause, but were less specific as to what should go in it. And we were concerned that actually just simply having a clause that says, you buyer will not recycle this vessel um, or, or send it for scrap, but will trade it, in a sense gives a false sense of security for a seller who really needs to be doing its due diligence in circumstances where to the reasonable person looking from the outside, it was perfectly obvious that that vessel was of a type and an age and a condition that might be ready for um, recycling or scrapping. So we came down on the side that for the printed terms, for the general terms, it was not appropriate to put in the recycling or non-recycling clause. Um, however, mindful that this is something which is obviously of import to certain aspects of the market, it is something that BIMCO have been looking at. And Francis, if you're there, do you want to have a few words of what the, the BIMCO position is in terms of recycling a recycling clause? Yeah, thanks, Matt. And um, yeah, there was so uh, when we uh, put this to the industry, there were, I think we had a, the most comments were on this on this point. I think we had about 20 to 30 comments, if I'm not mistaken, um, commenting on whether there should be something in relation to recycling. And just to um, to give you the uh, BIMCO's uh, the BIMCO official view at the moment is that what we would like to do is to try and accommodate uh, some of those people who were calling for this kind of clause is to develop a standalone clause that um, that uh, parties can actually insert in their sale contracts. So uh, we've established a subcommittee. We, it's already been um, composed, and we're just waiting to have our first meeting on that, um, and hopefully in the very near future that will happen. And so you will have something, hopefully, in your drawer, which you can just pull out and then um, use for your um, sale and purchase transactions. So that's work in progress. Um, so we're dealing with it, um, and uh, that's the latest news uh, hot off the press uh, for you here. Matt, is there anything else for you? Um, I'm looking at Grant. Who, thank you very it? much for looking at me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Francis. If you'd like to take your seat again, we okay. now move on to the Q&A bit. Uh, now, I've actually received quite a lot of questions from our uh, online participants. This is not a competition, but I am opening the floor to you, those of you seated in front of If you have any questions for the panel, this is now your opportunity. Otherwise, I'll just start reading them off my list. So is, is there anyone? We've got microphones and everything, so you don't have to shout. Sorry, there's a, now I can't actually see blinded by the light, but yeah, we're gonna get a microphone here. Uh, good morning, and thank you for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm Rosie Gonkor from Law Firm Hill Dickinson. And first, the question I have um, is probably um, to Christoph, but of course, if uh, everyone else can commit as well. So my question is in, in relation to underwater inspection. And um, I just wanted to ask, uh, because um, uh, we've recently been looking into the interpretation of the word conditions and whether conditions uh, would, you know, sort of be limited to uh, atmosphere conditions like you know, water, wind, swell, and, and so on, or whether it can be interpreted more widely. And um, also in this regard, um, uh, the question which um, uh, arose recently is, for example, what happens if uh, at the delivery port, which is usually nominated uh, by the sellers within the specific delivery range, what happens if there are no divers available? And uh, for example, of course, we understand that it's the buyer's uh, obligation to arrange uh, the diving inspection, but of course they cannot do that themselves. They have to have qualified team. Usually it's quite a large team that is required. Um, and you know, there is this tension as to what uh, you know the class where can say about the conditions if there are no divers available thank you thank you very much for the question um for the conditions i would think it is in a way fairly simple because it's fully in the hands of the classification society to make that decision if they feel the place is unsafe in the way that you described it or unsuitable in terms of 
weather, uh, water quality, things like that, then they have the sort of right to tell the parties you have to bring the ship elsewhere. And that is also regulated how this will go and okay. So, so you would if, say if that it, this was uh, the answer to your question. Yes. Yeah, so for example, if there are no divers available. Yeah, that's the second part. Uh -huh. So the condition is clear, I hope. I see. I mean my reply. So on, on the um on the divers, um I think again um the uh the buyers have to arrange for this and um have to make sure that uh, a diver is available and if um, if it is not what would you say matt um because I, I, can, I can just develop so we we had the situation actually it was a case uh, which we had and which settled but that was in relation to uh, the period uh, during covid where effectively no one could travel yeah. uh, to the port and uh, there were just simply no divers available mm. who could attend the inspection. And the vessel was then uh, tendered for delivery very, very close to the canceling date. And the question arose then, which, you know, what happens to the deposit mainly, of course, and yes. uh, to, to the sale in question? Okay, uh, I mean, the contract, uh, the, 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 the basis situation is the buyers have to arrange for it. How they do it, is their job. If the situations uh, uh, come into a, a region that you described, I think it's a it's a matter of going aside from the from the contract because these circumstances probably cannot be covered uh, in all detail. And then the buyer should approach the seller. I mean, that's a that's not a contract thing. That's a let's say a consequence of the situation when it arises. Uh, and they have to find a mutual agreement how to uh, overcome that. So, but here's Matt. Thank you. No, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with Christoph at all. I think it's a fair it's a fair point, and it in some ways goes back to the point I was just making about where you draw the line between force majeure and simply one side having to take a risk. Who should bear the risk? Um, here, we, you know, you are right, there is a risk, the buyer is responsible, it's their risk that they can't get the diver there um, at, at that place at that time. Um, but when you balance it against having a clause in there that then starts to go into force majeure, and you look and say, well, actually, how many times is this a problem mm -hmm. against, if you try to create some sort of force majeure situation, that could be abused or used all the time and create uncertainty. So I think it's really, as, as you say, it's, it, it's not perfect, but you've got to fall one side of the line, and this gives certainty of contract, even though occasionally it may create a difficult result. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And maybe just uh, to add a little bit, uh, the, the, the new um, clause that we put in at least covers a little bit the buyer's uh, uh, obligations uh, in the delay, I would, I would think. Because, uh, you know, it, it, it uh, says, okay, you have to arrange it. If the ship comes there and for whatever reasons that you described, uh, uh, you are unable to bring a diver there. It could be a little bit going into this area. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed for your question. While we're on Clause 8, the underwater inspection, there is another question here. Um, and the question is, there's no reference to class notes or memoranda affecting vessels class. Is that on purpose? Um, so the answer to this one is that if you go to, Casper, could you go to the um, um, interpretation clause uh, in Clause 1? And at the bottom of clause one, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm glasses. Um, if you see that uh, at, um, at C, so rather than where with the, uh, some of the other forms where uh, they mention it each time there is a reference to um, uh, conditions or recommendations, here um, in, uh, we've, we've housed it in the interpretation clause. And as you'll see, for any requirement of disagreement, that certificates are to be without conditional recommendation, notes or memoranda in the reports. Um, uh, shall not be taken into account. So it's 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 there. Um, it's in the interpretation clause. 
Thanks, Matt. Good answer. Any other questions from our audience here? Yes, sir. Thank you, Wang <clears throat> Andersen, Nordisk Defence Club. Um, I think one of the main features of uh, Ship Sail 22 is the guarantee provision, um, which is a goodie in uh, Francis's goodie bag. Um, but I have to admit, um, I wonder uh, whether and how uh, these provisions will actually fly. Because uh, as a matter of English law, there is nothing about uh, consideration, and this is certainly not a deed. Um, I might, might be making too much out of it, but um, still I would like to pose that as a question. And um, as a matter of civil law, at least, um, uh, there is nothing about what kind of a guarantee this is. Uh, is it an on-demand guarantee or uh, is it a guarantee whereby you have to exhaust um, your claim towards the debtor before you can go to the guarantor? And also, I thought it would have been a good idea to tie in the guarantor to the same uh, choice of law and jurisdiction as uh, between the parties, so that you know where to sue the, the guarantor. And then probably a more noble point, but it's the placing of the signature box, uh, particularly the one in respect of the guarantor, but maybe also in respect of the other parties. Um, uh, I would have thought it would make sense to put it at the end of the agreement, particularly given the fact that there is nothing between part one and two on top of the signatory boxes um, uh, that they say or confirm that they're bound by both part one and part two. Thank you very much, Magda. And I have to say as well that we've been asked this question online as well about the guarantees as well, so we'd be really interested to hear the answer on that one. Um. No, uh, thanks for those questions. Um, I'll, I'll, there were quite a few bits to that, so I'll try and cover, make sure I cover each one. Um, I, I think that um, the starting point is that, um, um, as I said, I think when I was going through the contract, um, in most cases, in most cases where there is going to be um, a guarantee, um, certainly in the transactions I work on, um, the guarantee is actually contained in a separate instrument. Um, um, so I think this, what I would expect to see um, in, in, in ship sale 22 is that the guarantor, whether it's for the buyer or the seller or both, will be identified in the contract, um, but not necessarily a signatory to it. Um, we did discuss then whether we should leave it at that, but as we know, there are circumstances where using other forms, um, the guarantee is simply um, referred to whether it's a parent or somebody else, and it simply says, and these obligations will be, um, will be guaranteed by X. Um, and um, the parties, in a sense, um, leave, it, leave the law to fall where it may, but they prefer to use this short form where it's a parent. Um, uh, but as I say, in most cases where you want to get it right, the questions that you raise as to whether it's going to be an on-demand uh, guarantee or something um, less, um, that needs to be stipulated. The other thing we have to remember, of course, is as we saw when we looked at the um, law and arbitration um, provision, is that it may not always be English law. You mentioned, of course, that you know civil law as well. Um, this is another, obviously, challenge one has when you're trying to produce a standard form that will work across all of the different sectors in the shipping market, but also has to not be only applicable for one system of law. So one has to be very careful uh, when one goes down um, that route to ensure that you are sometimes lacking specificity in order to ensure that you're uh, going to at least make the document usable, whichever of those systems of law you use. Um, the question I'm not going to answer, because I don't know the answer, is, is about the placement of the of the signatures. Um, I don't know if you can take that. I mean, I, I, do we? The placement. I think that's a good one for you, Francis, isn't it? <laughs> I don't mind answering it, but I mean, the, the fact is, as you know, Magda, this is, you know, we're introducing a box layout into a ship sale agreement. Uh, we haven't uh, had that before. That is BIMCO standard format and layout. So that is normally where we would put the signature box rather than at the end of the agreement. So. Um, 
So, uh, okay. All right. Um, so we're getting towards the uh, the end of our session now. I know there's lots of questions uh, come in online. Uh, what I will say to everyone that is online, I'll walk back in a second now, um, is that we will send written answers to you. Well, I say we. I mean, these gentlemen here, I will pass them the questions and they will answer them. So you will get a reply to the questions you've raised. There's just too many for us to deal with in the amount of time that we've got at the moment. Um, I'm just going to quickly put one of the online questions to you before we, we come back to you. Um, and apparently there are other ship sale agreement forms available in the marketplace. It's not just ship sale. So I have to make a reference to it. In the sale form 2012, it excludes a uh, reference to the sale of goods or it excludes the sale of goods acts 1979. Does ship sale? And if not, why not? Um, if 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 memory serves, the um, ship sales, uh, sorry, sale form 2012 does not expressly exclude, does not make reference to the sale of goods act precisely for the reason I just gave that it may that that would be far too specific because that's an English law issue. Um, rather, it actually excludes um, the implied statutory terms, whichever statute um, applies. Um, we do. Um, in our entire agreement clause, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the numbers now, 26, 25, I'm so sorry. So if you see there in, um, um, boom, 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 there we go. Yeah, 25C, um, in fact, what we've done here, um, we've gone belt and braces um, following the, the, the in, this is an English case law issue, um, following um, certain um, uh, uh, cases in English law, which say that if you want to exclude the Sale of Goods Act, you have to do so in no uncertain terms. Um, and therefore, we have said that if any term and crucially condition representation statement, et cetera, et cetera, um, capable of being implied into this agreement by any applicable custom statute. So there's the statute that would get you your Sale of Goods Act. Um, is excluded, then it will be excluded. So that's where we do it. So we've, we've, we've not only done the statute, which would cover the Sale of Goods Act, but we've broadened it out um, to um, customs um, as well. Lovely, thank you very much indeed, Matt. One very last quick question from, from the audience there, please. Uh, can we got a microphone? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just have a quick question about sanctions clause, if I may, which is probably topical at the moment. Uh, according to the current um, 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 sanction clause, uh, can you please explain what would happen to the deposit if uh, one of the uh, parties are sanctioned? And a second uh, uh, um, question would be, do I understand correctly that the current sanction clause does not really cover the situation where sort of sectoral sanctions are imposed? Because uh, at the moment, specifically, we see quite a few uh, disputes uh, where you know none of the none of the parties are sanctioned. However, the, uh, there is a prohibition of uh, sale of uh, certain vessels. Thank you. Yeah, two very good questions. In fact, um, the answer to the um, the first question um, is about what we actually did, and there's something I actually forgot to mention: is that if you see what happens if there's a breach. Um, of the clause, uh, there's a termination right and a claim for damages. A, a thread throughout uh, the sale for ship sale uh, 22 is that we refer back to clause clauses 18 and 19, where provision is made. Uh, what happens if there's a termination and the deposit is released? Blah blah blah. That we haven't done here, specifically for the reason that you've just given, because there may be problems with the release of the deposit if there's a breach of sanctions, that money may be blocked. So that's why we didn't. So the, um, the remedy here is uh, termination uh, and the right to claim damages. We don't mention anything about the deposit. Whilst we do in other clauses where there's a termination right, we do then mention what happens to the deposit, if you can follow what I mean. So that's why we expressly left it out here. Um, not necessarily. That have to be dealt with, um, you know, um, with, with through the courts maybe, because the, the deposit will probably be blocked. And then, uh, how can you get that deposit released? It will probably have to go through the courts. No. No, I don't think it would be an automatic. 
Uh, apologies. Yes, uh, what, what I mean is that we, we currently see uh, quite a few bespoke clauses uh, where, where the parties deal with a, a refund of a deposit, for example. So uh, you, sometimes that, you know, if one san a party is sanctioned, uh, the, the deposit is basically being refunded and then damages are claimed as a separate sort of uh, item. Sometimes the deposit uh, is appropriated uh, by unsanctioned party. It, it could be, but uh, the banks will still have to uh, approve that release. And so there may be instances where the banks say, oh, this is sanctioned and the money remains where it is until it's resolved through the courts. So that may be an issue, uh, an issue with regard to the deposit that it may not automatically be released, even if the parties have agreed separately that uh, the, un the unaffected party would get uh, the, the, the deposit returned. Mm. I think, that's, I think that's the answer to your question. But, uh, Thank you. And your second question was about, um, you, you were talking about sectoral? Sect yes, for example, if, uh, if no, none of the parties are subject, subject to sanctions, however, the, 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 the main object of the agreement sale of a particular vessel uh, ha is being pro prohibited uh, by relevant authorities. I think it would come under the sanctioned activity definition. Um, I think because it's a very objective test, sort of uh, sanctioned activity means any service, carriage, trade, or voyage subject to sanctions imposed, that would automatically trigger the clause. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But if you, if, if you want to discuss afterwards the, the, the bit about the deposit, I'll feel free. Thank you so but much. Thank you. thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Francis. Um, just before we wrap up here, um, You've all got one of these on your seats. This is a takeaway. It's a freebie. We're not charging you money for it. Um, please feel free, if you've got a friend, to take a second copy. If you've got two friends, take two copies. There's a pile of them over there. Uh, we want to spread the word about this. We think it's a great document. This is a very good way to introduce the document and explain the background thinking to it all. Uh, I should have mentioned at the start that this whole proceeding has been recorded and will be available online. So, uh, again, you could watch it back if you particularly want to. Uh, I'm now going to invite George Eddings from the uh, London Shipping Law Centre just to say a few closing words for us. So, George, if you'd like to come up. Thank you, Grant, and good morning, everyone. Um, as a director of the LSLC, I want to say how delighted we are to uh, partner with BIMCO in putting on this presentation. Um, the LSLC um, put together something like two or three lectures uh, a month throughout the year and without a shadow of a doubt I want to say that this is one of the most important lectures that we've been associated with so I just wanted to say two things one is to thank BIMCO and secondly to thank the panel for such an informative um, explanation it's been uh, such an informative morning so thank you very much so I'm sure can I invite the, the audience to I'll invite you to put your hands together and thank the panel. I think it's been superb. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed, George, and thank you also to the London Shipping Law Centre for helping us uh, prepare all of this as well. It's been uh, a very valued partnership. Uh, Francis, you'd like to say a few words as well? Yeah, just to close off, um, thanks very much for those uh, kind words um, for us. Um, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to be able to explain a little bit about uh, ship sale uh, to you today. Um, and this is the, the, the part of the show where I have to really pump you up because uh, this is uh, a promotion for uh, ship sale 22. Um, it's very important that you use the new form and I'll, I've just jotted down a few reasons why. Well, it's, it's been 10 years since uh, um, there was sale form 2012. That's 10 years where a lot of things have changed. And so uh, this is an update and a facelift. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why you should be using this form. It's very user friendly. Um, if you look at the box format, you could even use the box format as a format for a recap even. So it makes it all very, very easy. Um, the list of documents has been taken out of the body the list of excluded items has been taken out of the body, so it's all very uh, easy to use and easy to amend. The form also follows the normal sequence of events, the normal progression of a sale process, so that's also uh, very, very important and very nice. And also it's um, a modernized document. It includes sanctions and anti-corruption clauses, as we've just discussed, uh, things that parties usually add on to sale form 2012. Now they're already in there, 
so it will cut down the time uh, for negotiation. Although I do appreciate that some parties do have their boilerplate sanctions and anti-corruption clauses which they may want to impose. But anyway, I think this, the inclusion of the sanctions and anti-corruption clause makes our lives a lot, uh, a lot easier. And also just to mention that uh, there's mention made of modernizations, things that have come up very recently during the lockdown, during COVID. I think COVID has had a lot of negatives, but it's also had a lot of positives. It's meant that we've done our business or we're doing our business in a different way. And so there's a re reference to remote closing, something you don't have in uh, 2012. And also what I discussed, uh, what I, I mentioned to you earlier, um, electronic signatures, making it very, very easy to sign. So to conclude, I commend this uh, document to all of you. I would say go out and uh, sell the message. Uh, it's very, very important because I think this will be the standard going forward. Uh, and what's nice about it, it still retains a lot of the familiarity that uh, uh, about sale and purchase that you had with 2012. A lot of that familiarity is still there. A lot of the uh, clauses uh, are very similar, but at the same time, they've been amended and uh, fine-tuned to bring it up to date and make it uh, very much more user-friendly. So um, that's all I wanted to say. Um, and just thank my colleagues as well here. Thank Grant, thank Casper, thank uh, the Secretariat of BIMCO for all the work they've done. And I think it was uh, quite a glitzy sort of stage to be on um, and be able to present, uh, present this to you. And thanks for your attendance and um, hopefully um, we might see each other in the future at another seminar, or I don't know, perhaps, uh, perhaps not, um, and wish you all a very nice uh, day. Thank you very much. Thanks.